We are sitting with Josh Mallerman right now at the Midwest Literary Walk. Josh, your book is Bird Box, getting an enormous amount of buzz, now in paperback. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is all really exciting for me. Uh, I've been writing for decades. And just, I never, you know, the manuscript started to pile up, rough draft after rough draft. And I never, had, I never looked at those books with the desperation or with dollar signs in my eyes. I was never like, I have to get these published, you know. And, but at the same time, I was always fantasizing about them getting published, you know. So the experience that I'm in the middle of right now and sitting here with you and the reading that we just did, it, it's all, you know, a little overwhelming. And at the same time, it's, it's almost like a relief. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, yeah. ah, this is, this is working right now. This is happening. This is great. Let's go. Where did the idea, though, for Bird Box, which has been a breakthrough novel for you, you said you've written all these other books and there's these manuscripts piling up. Bird Box broke through. There's a lot of love for this book. It's getting new readers. Yes. Um, tell me where that idea came from. Well, when I was younger, when I was like 13 years old, the, um, there's a teacher who mentioned that uh, a man would go mad lose his mind if he were to attempt to fathom infinity. All right, bear with me. So I went home that night frightened at the idea, you know, and I went and talked to my mom about it. Like, if I tried to imagine where space ends, am I going to lose my mind? You know, Josh, what are you talking about? Relax, blah, blah, blah. And I really started thinking about it, and it became like a monstrous concept to me. All right, so, so at some point, I... I started to think of infinity or something the human mind can't assimilate as a monster and what if that idea was actually like personified so on your front porch infinity is on the porch swing outside swinging infinity is out there and if you open the door and encounter it well you're you can't assimilate it you're gonna go mad something like that so that to me was like a, that was a scary monster it's a big idea it sounds like a huge idea, and then, but when you put it in the confines of a horror story, it becomes almost, yeah, like, like a, an elastic sort of Twilight Zone episode or something. But, so then I had, uh, just for no good reason, I had a mother blindfolded and um, her two kids, or two kids blindfolded with her in a rowboat traveling down a river. That's where I started. I just thought it was a good freaky situation. I'm like, what are they fleeing? What are they fleeing? And I was like, ah, maybe, maybe they're fleeing infinity. And that, that was it right there, boom, and wrote the rough draft in 26 days. Wow. Yeah. Your band is the High Strong. Yep. You've been together for how long? Oh my God, since, we've been best friends since we were 10. I'm turning 40 in a couple months. Um, Derek already is 40. And I, we got serious though in like 2000. We moved to New York City and we got serious. Serious meaning, I mean, if the option was, you know, going to grad school or going into the workforce or starting a band in New York, well, that felt pretty serious at the time, right? And so, yeah, so I would say like 15 years, 14, 15 years. And did you find that creative, I mean, songwriting is another form of writing, obviously, and we're going to talk about the way you combine them now, but uh, did you know that that wasn't enough, that you wanted to do this other thing, or were you just completely on the band kick for a long time? Well, no, we, the reason I was asked to join the band was because I was writing. And they were like, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous in hindsight. It's a perfect, like... <laughs> rocker moment when, when the guys were like, hey, you write, well, why don't you just write our songs? You know, I'm like, uh, okay, you know. And I didn't know, I had no idea what they were talking about, but some of those poems I mentioned, a friend of mine was reading them while they, uh, Derek and Chad had been playing music forever, reading those poems while they were playing. And that opened my eyes, I was like, oh, I, I get what's going on. Mark is singing a poem while they're making music, blah, blah, blah. Chad, the bass player, taught me a few chords on the organ, and that was kind of enough to learn. If you learned one, it was enough to learn, well, then this, if this is a C, then that must be a D, and so forth. And if you move one finger over for a C minor, well, the same holds true of these. All of a sudden, you know, like, 36 chords. And believe me, the band doesn't use more than 36 chords. So, you know, I guess the writing, I was writing already, they asked me to join, and then I was, like, ecstatic, fell in love with it, and then it just was like a two branch from there. We toured for about six years um, without apartments, whatever, we just like touring the country, just kept going. About 250 shows a year, all in the US, like no, well, some Canada. And you know, I guess along the way between cities, I would write novels. Yeah, so it was always together, always happening together. And I think the guys just thought, you know, like yeah, Josh is serious about it, but I don't, 
I, almost, I think that they were just kind of like, like Chad's reading, Derek's driving, Josh is writing, hey, let's play, you know? And I don't think any of us were really thinking like, Josh is forging another career here in the van. So your event here was a mix of music and you're playing the organ and you're, you blend the mediums. Do you see the ability to do that down the road? Yes. Is that something you've always thought about? From both sides. Like, I would love the High Strung to put out an album. It does not spoken word, but like a, not necessarily a concept album, but how do you, like, maybe like a radio drama. But, but in the radio drama, maybe one of the guys is a songwriter. So we could have like actual like songs in there too. I would love to have like an album that there was really only like four or five like, you know, centerpiece songs, maybe even two, surrounded by a story where we each, everyone plays different parts, whatever. It doesn't have to be scary, maybe it's funny, maybe it's just a straight story, whatever. And then on the book side also, what, when HarperCollins told me, um, you, now you go on a book tour. And I was like, okay, what does that entail? And I had gone to see um, Tom Wolfe in uh, Barnes & Noble at Union Square when I lived in New York. And even him I was like bored by after like 20 minutes. I'm like, this is like, he's wearing like the white suit and everything, you know, and I'm like, all right, what else is going on? So when they were like, oh, you just stand in a podium and read, and I'm like, really? That Tom Wolfe wasn't even fun that way. No, I'm not, I can't just stand in a podium and read. I think part of it was stage fright. You know, you get up and talk about yourself for like 45 minutes, sounds horrible. And then I kind of realized, like, man, dude, all the characters in your book are blindfolded. They just blindfold the audience, you know? And, and then we'll add, at that point, it was like, okay, now it's a radio drama. Well, radio dramas also have music, so why don't the boys play? Blah, blah, blah. I just submitted book two to HarperCollins, and I'm trying to think of the same thing I can do, you know, for that one. Yeah. Like some sort of just, it doesn't have to be insane. Like that, real fast, that book includes a, um, like a, like, an, like a creepy sound that these guys are trying to locate the source of in the jungle. And maybe next time around all the audience members have their individual headphones all hooked up to this, this one thing that we can like raise, the, something like that. Yeah, You're, you talk about the community, the horror community. You're going to a convention coming up soon. Who, who was part of your horror diet when you were younger? Well, the first one I ever read was a Dean Koontz book called The Face of Fear. I, man, I was born in 75. So to be um, from 85 to uh, 90, I was you know, uh, 10 to 15. That, and that's like the age where you sort of fall in love with it or you don't. That was a golden age, obviously Stephen King, but Richard Lehman, um, Robert McCammon, uh, what's his name, Brian Lumley. Brian Lumley has all those Necroscope books. If you've ever seen, they have the crazy skull covers. And these, I mean, they were thrilling, man. We would, I would walk into a bookstore in, I grew up in West Bloomfield, Michigan. I would walk into a bookstore, and that section was almost like, I can't believe they let this in here, you know? It was like the craziest images, and, and I think that's probably what, what first attracted me to it, like a wolf coming out of a guy's mouth. Not a guy turning into a wolf, a wolf coming out of his mouth, and things like that. So that 85 to 90, which is probably one of a few like golden ages of horror. I mean, that's exactly, I was the perfect age to fall in love with all those guys. You're, in fact, your book was just nominated for a Bram Stoker Award for new, new fiction. Um, great reviews almost everywhere. You get these, your name in the same sentence as Stephen King in some of the reviews and things. It's gotta feel satisfying knowing that you've been thinking about this for a long time. Yeah, well, especially with horror. I mean, you know, you know in a way it makes sense. It's like if a man, you know, what he puts his, energy or efforts into, something will come out of that. It may not be what he's going after, but some ripple effect, you're going to be involved in some way. And I put all my energy into the band that I'm in and writing horror novels and reading horror novels. I've been on a strict horror diet for like decades now. And so in, in, on one level, you know, it, it makes sense that I'm in this world and I'm talking with these people, I'm going to World Horror Convention next month, that kind of thing. But these things like the Bram Stoker Award nomination and what you said, like Stephen King and these things, it, it almost feels like you're being like knighted or welcomed into like a fraternity or something. Where for years I just read about these names and now I'm like reading their stuff and talking to them online about it and meeting them in person. You know, hey, Jack Ketchum, I love that book, that kind of thing. And yeah, in a way it's like a dream come true. And in another way, it's like if you're logical about it, well, that's where you put all your energy. So it makes sense.